All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Liz Mdars. I'm the head of adult services at the Middleton Public Library. And I want to welcome you to our final Scholar for Life lecture of 2020. Tonight, we are very excited to have Aaron Berg Bear here with us to present Hidden in Plain Sight, the Native American Cultural Landscape. Aaron is a citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Diné nations and is currently serving as the Director of Tribal Relations at UW-Madison. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you, Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the generous welcome. And so for the slide we're looking at now, um, I took this photo myself of, of a display board at a place called the Forks, um, which is where the Cinnabon and Red River meet in what is now called Winnipeg, Canada. And so on the map, there's a, on the very bottom center, you can see the Forks and that's uh, where the site is. But I, I chose this photo tonight just to show, um, we have uh, indigenous languages represented, we have French languages represented, we have English represented. So just a really powerful kind of display of, of how we can understand a place. Um, and we can see the kind of uh, different ways people connect to this place and how they describe that place in some way. So I, I find it very powerful. And the fur trade is a really important um, story of the Great Lakes itself and, and how the Great Lakes is colonized um, in the early times with the fur trade economy. All this, uh, I use this as to say is that, you know, as, as a member of the Mandan Hadass and Rikara Nation, I'm not from the Western Great Lakes. So I am just like everyone else who is non-Indigenous to the Western Great Lakes. I am a guest here. And uh, the stuff you will be sharing today is all in the public domain. You can go find it all if you uh, go look for these pieces. But I want to do a quick overview about the incredible specialness of this place tonight. And then I'll have a chance for questions at the end. So, <coughs> pardon me. So, Hani Chada Hai Pi, Aaron Birdbear Ga Hini Gaide. And I just said, I'm happy to be here. My name is Aaron Birdbear in the Ho-Chunk language, uh, the people of the sacred voice, because uh, this greater Madison region is the ancestral homelands of uh, the Ho-Chunk. The Ho-Chunk nation are still here today. Um, so it's a wonderful continuity of their culture and their way of life here uh, in what they call Dejo performance. So usually the questions I always have people reflect on. And this poster was designed for K-12 public school teachers so that they can kind of begin teaching the history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the First Nations of Wisconsin. And so the questions we always ask is like, how long have humans lived here, where you, where you live or where your school is located? On whose ancestral lands do you live? And, and who are your tribal natives today? And so just a real quick answering of those questions, uh, we'll, we'll take a look. So here we have uh, some evidence of back in the day, we had a uh, Glacial Lake Yahara, one big lake here in the Madison region. We can see that big lake in the white section of this image. And there are small black triangles located around this giant Lake Yahara that was here 12,000 years ago. And those triangles represent kind of sites of human activity 12,000 years ago. And there's particular types of technologies that were very, very um, widespread, but used for a very short period of time. And they're really dated to a time and a place somewhat like uh, the smartphones that we have today. If you went back before 2008, there are no smartphones. If we went to see an iPhone 1, um, we would know that that technology was dated to a very specific time and place. And so the evidence around this giant glacial Lake Yahara is what we call it today, uh, shows 12,000 years. So at least we now know 12,000 years is how long humans have lived here. And then UW-Madison, because of this 12,000 year human story, uh, the archaeological studies of campus so that we can continue campus development. Uh, this kind of shows the breadth of archaeological sites along um, the shore of Lake Mendota. So the southern shore of Lake Mendota near where the university is and where Picnic Point is on the map. And, and the brown areas are habitation sites and the blue areas are uncategorized burial sites and the red sections are categorized burial sites. And so we just have villages that go back thousands of years on this lake of this humans living, doing what humans do, getting each other's business, just being humans and loving, laughing, um, celebrating one another, celebrating uh, the world around them. And so if we forward a little bit more on whose ancestral lands do we live, here's another map created by the ways.org, PBS Wisconsin Education, just a really powerful hub for helping teachers teach the native nations of Wisconsin. And we see this beautiful ancestral lands map. So if we look in the center of the map, it's, there's a brown section that uh, says Ho-Chunk, 
we can see four blue circles in that map, and that's us, that's the four lakes, that's Dejok, or four lakes in the Ho-Chunk language. So we can tell that we're, we're in the ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk, as well as uh, we can see the forest county of Potawatomi, Minami, and the Ojibwe. And then we can see contemporary reservations throughout the map. Um, today, if we want to know who our tribal neighbors are today, we can see the Native Nations of Wisconsin. Uh, we can, we have 12 Native Nations, uh, 11 are federally recognized, one is non-recognized, and that's a complicated story of, of how and why tribal sovereignty can be rescinded uh, through various means along the way. So the Brotherton Nation are, are the non-recognized tribe of the state. Um, but here we have the incredible, uh, powerful, amazing, vibrant Native Nations of Wisconsin. And so I just remind people of, of it's hard to get a sense of, of how new the United States is in this region. The um, United States doesn't move into the Western Great Lakes until after the War of 1812. And so in 1820s and 30s are the first time US citizens are penetrating into this area of the continent. And, and so on the timeline, if we took that 12,000 year story and turned it into a timeline, uh, UW Madison and, and the state were both co-created in 1848. And that's literally the last 1.4% of this timeline. So 98.6% of the humanity of the Four Lakes is, is, uh, happens before the arrival of European Americans uh, in the form of the United States. Um, there were some early arrivals of French people in the 16 and 1700s in this place. And, and we see all the French place names of the state um, that kind of a testament to the depth of French presence for 200 years before the United States even arrived in this region. We see mostly in the northern parts of the state. Um, and yet, you know, how we kind of miss the, the hidden in plain sight theme of tonight is that we describe this place, despite it being 12,000 years of human occupation, uh, from the Wisconsin idea, the very powerful idea of service and, and giving back to our state in some way and enhancing the well-being of others in some way. Uh, from the Wisconsin idea of the book that it came out, it says Wisconsin is fundamentally a German state. Uh, the Germans were the first to arrive in significant numbers although they were later followed by large influx of Norwegians. And I'm like, why well, wasn't this place occupied to pull a lot of people? Um, so it just kind of reminds us of how the narratives we share sometimes obscure uh, the, the full humanity of the space and the different cultures in the space prior to the arrival of America. And we can kind of get a sense of, of that further obscuring of the indigeneity of this space uh, when we see Wisconsin's founding vision for itself. And we can see that in the territorial seal on the left, it's in black and white image. Um, and this is original territorial seal of Wisconsin, and it became the state seal of Wisconsin for one year before it was changed to a different seal. And we see a more modern version of the seal today for the state. But when we look at the original seal of Wisconsin, we can see the motto in Latin. Um, it says, Civilitas Successor Barbarum, which is uh, civilization succeeds barbarism. And so, you know, in the creation of Wisconsin, it's kind of envisioned as a white space cleared of indigenous inhabitants. And this seal on the left side kind of shows us that. It's a graphic novel showing exactly the terraforming of the state and cutting down trees and plowing the land and doing some mining activity. And then we see a Native American figure kind of in the left center, kind of heading westward, uh, going to pop on the steamships and be removed out of the state. And so we get a sense of if Wisconsin describes itself as this new entity, this new idea of a, a the state where people kind of rule themselves in a new form of government, at least for Europeans and European Americans, that um, uh, we see the kind of original vision is, is, is literally just a, a white space cleared of indigenous inhabitants. And so when that kind of narrative begins the story, we often don't look before 1848. So often 1848 becomes a kind of barrier for us to have to penetrate through in some way. And so it just reminds us about the idea of conscious cultural connection to place. Um, and that's just like how we understand our connection to this place. What are our connections to this place? Um, how have we named things? How have we relate to this place? What is our spiritual you know, connection to this place in some way? Um, and so it's just a reminder that both the Menominee and Ho-Chunk nations, uh, the Menominee and Ho-Chunk people have creation stories that situate them in what is now known as Wisconsin. So in the creation stories, they have come to be in this place as humans. And, and so it just reminds us of how deep their connection really is. And, and the Menominee have been here for, you know, 10,000 years and counting. And so their language and culture reflects the depth of their connection to this space, both physically and spiritually. In some way, the Ho-Chunk have this deep story that goes back to Mogashuch, the Red Banks, their first village, which is what is now near Green Bay, Wisconsin. So these really powerful creation stories about how they're connected to place. 
and as an exercise to get us to think about our conscious cultural connection to place, since we can't normally discuss with each other uh, in these types of presentations. I want you to self-reflect and, and just tell me what you think the meaning of this word, without any help. You know, what do these words mean to you uh, beyond just a geographic signifier, meaning that it's a specific location on, on planet Earth? Um, what do these words mean? You know, what does the word Wisconsin mean? What does the word Mendota mean? And, and there's longer explanations about you know, these names today, but um, Wisconsin is a bit of a contested name. Um, some, the Wisconsin Historical Society asserts that uh, two French gentlemen couldn't read each other's handwriting and uh, a mescousing, a cursive M became an OU letter in French. So that M, like mom, went to W, like wow. Uh, so uh, just kind of a, a possibly a mis, mis kind of a translation between two gentlemen result in a state name today, which is, you know, for the most part, if that's the definition of kind of gibberish to some degree. Um, but now many nations assert that Wisconsin is a derivation of one of their words. And so like a good place to live. So here we have a contested term, even our understanding of Wisconsin today can be limited. Some of the indigenous peoples of the state uh, kind of have a different understanding of that term compared to how we understand that term. And then equally Mendota. Uh, Mendota is the name of a lake here uh, in the Four Lakes. And one of the early, uh, Governor Farwell was a land speculator and he needed to make 10,000 brochures and he needed quick names for the lake. And so uh, Lyman Draper and a few other people came up with a series of names and they, they thought they were kind of Native American in origin, but not necessarily. And so Mendota is mostly gibberish. Uh, it's definitely not a Ho-Chunk language word. And we're in uh, the land of the Ho-Chunk, the people of the sacred voice. And it's definitely not one of their words. So we're, how do we get these interesting place names that maybe aren't directly related to the indigenous people who live in this place? And then for a deeper understanding of the space, we really have to take some, some steps back and we have to understand a little bit about the force removal history of this place and how that interrupts our understanding of the space. Um, why things are hidden in plain sight is that uh, a lot of the stories we tell kind of, we dance around the more difficult chapters of our own histories and we, we often don't discuss them, not recognizing that by not addressing the force removal history, it, it, it doesn't allow us to understand the space as well because it negates the kind of uh, violence and brutality that interrupts uh, some of the indigenous knowledge of the space. Um, we also have to understand different value systems. What love and respect mean to indigenous peoples, I think is very different than the definitions of love and respect that we have for the English language and how we relate to one another. Um, you know, love would be love of all living beings, you know, that uh, plant, animal, uh, and how they nourish us in some way and how we're gonna be caring for all living beings in this space. And, and the notion of respect and care um, in a kinship kind of world um, and a little different than how we understand love and respect in usually the United States is you know, dictionary definitions of those words. As well as like grandfather teachings. People like Ojibwe have these really seven grandfather teachings that guide how they function as a society. So to, have, to really understand the space better, we, we need to understand kind of the different value systems that operate in this space simultaneously. Uh, we also have to understand water, a very different perspective on water. Um, the rivers, lakes, and springs. Um, the Ho-Chunk really were, uh, had lots of their settlements on the inlets and exits of rivers, of, of lakes, kind of the inlets and outlets, a really important concept to them, these inlets and outlets. Um, and that rivers, lakes, and springs are really viewed in, in dynamic ways that we don't necessarily view them today. And so our relationship to rivers, lakes, and springs is very different than indigenous relationships to rivers, lakes, and springs. Uh, we also have to consider how culture and language inform our relationships to place. Um, the Menominee in their State of the Tribes address described how they were operating under a compact with nature, that they're going to ensure that they um, created an environment that, that allowed for the happiness and success of all living beings, be they plant or animal. And so this compact with nature versus kind of a capitalist extraction view of the land um, and how we connect to it. So when I talk about extraction, uh, I think about the Department of Natural Resources, just the framing of the idea of natural resources, clearly there for some use in some way. And, and then the capitalist patriarchy that is the system that the United States operates under, it's, it's gonna be kind of for profit. And so it might not be the same compact with nature relationship that indigenous societies had 
in this space and, and, and the different types of relationships we have to um, this place today and, and how our culture and language can reflect our relationships to place in some way. Um, we'll need to practice cultural humility. We'll need to quiet our own culture and be open to other perspectives and viewpoints um, that might seem a little different than ours, but uh, it's something we have to practice. How do we quiet our own kind of culture to listen and, and learn from other cultures in some way? And then really the, there's a fundamental sense of the transformative power of this place, that it, it's so resource rich, it's so incredibly beautiful that uh, humans have been transformed by this place in uh, over thousands and thousands of years, and we continue to be transformed by this place in some way. So to understand this place a little better, we have to practice those skills. The forced removal history, here's just a quick diagram of uh, 40 years, uh, numerous military campaigns against the Ho-Chunk to, uh, in a failed attempt to remove them from Wisconsin. And so it just kind of reminds us in this incredible brutal story of violence and displacement, uh, duplicity and, and, and uh, some, the 1837 treaty in particular is, is legally dubious in, in so many different ways. And, and so the Ho-Chunk have this incredible story of love of this place. Their connection to this place is so powerful that despite 40 years and, and incredible hardships, uh, the Ho-Chunk you know, are so connected to this place that they return over and over and over again. So despite the United States' best effort to remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin, it fails. And so it's just an incredible story of love and resilience and Ho-Chunk connection to this place. And then we heard about that at our campus last fall. Uh, our Ho-Chunk uh, keynote speaker for the fall, uh, for the Our Shared Future effort at UW-Madison to educate ourselves about uh, the indigenous landscape, this place in some way. Our Ho-Chunk speaker, Samantha Skenador, former justice for the Ho-Chunk Supreme Court, uh, just talked about how these spaces are sacred to them. And just a reminder that the removal story is, a, is a, not unique just to the Ho-Chunk, but here is a kind of quick schematic of uh, the ethnic cleansing of almost half the continent in the form of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Most people know it as a trail of tears, but it really is a vast and, and sweeping act that impacts over 60 American Indian nations that are, many are deposited into what becomes Indian territory, what Oklahoma is today. Uh, the Ho-Chunk here have a reservation in Nebraska from this incredible displacement story. And the bottom map just shows us where Native Americans are today. Um, the darker the green on the lower map, the more Native Americans live in those counties. And so we can see the eastern seaboard is, is largely bereft of Native Americans because of the incredible removal processes that happened uh, a couple hundred years ago. And we're still dealing with the outcomes of those removals. It's, it's just an ongoing uh, uh, difficulties of trauma and, and recovery from just tremendous amounts of displacement of violence. But the cultural humility piece I bring up is that lifelong learning, right? It's something we're going to practice uh, for the remainder of our lives. And, and here, the orientations of these maps is a little different. Uh, we, we can see the, the kind of medicine wheel in the bottom, a kind of a worldview um, for how people understand their relationship to the natural world around them and, and, and to their own communities. And so, these maps are oriented to the sun. So where the sun rises, we the top of the page and it sets on the bottom of the page. And so indigenous kind of orientation to the space was much different um, not that long ago. Um, the compass was introduced to Europe 700 years ago and launched the age of sail. Uh, the compass was embedded in China and finally made its way to Europe. And then suddenly the whole way we orient our planet is different, right? So, um, and how we kind of orient ourselves and connect ourselves to this place. But, in these maps that are, here we have the Great Lakes on the left and the headwaters of the Mississippi in the lower right. And in the upper right, we can see all the different indigenous names for the Mississippi River. Uh, just a, a wealth of, of how people connected to that powerful resource and uh, that living dynamic river that sustained people for so long. And then it just reminds us about um, culture. You know, culture is shaped often from a, of a long period of connection to a place and we have to remember the environment of Wisconsin before it's colonized, before it's deforested, before the Baroque savanna is eradicated and that ecosystem only exists in small restoration patches now in the state. Um, but we can see the southern half of the state is oak savanna, pine savanna. Um, in the northern half, we can see the giant north woods and that big kind of block of color in the north uh, that shows us the incredible um, beauty of those forests. And so it just reminds us that humans shape this environment intentionally over time. And so the savannas in the south were largely byproducts of thousands of years of fire ecology or burning the space. And so I think the indigenous cultures and languages of the people whose creation stories situate them here in the Western Great Lakes 
um, really reflect an intimate understanding and connection to this place. Uh, Menominee language speaker Ron Korn in a video about uh, Menominee language revitalization described that the Menominee language in particular doesn't work very well for an indoor sedentary life, that their language is all about being engaging the forest around them in some way. And so um, if you live in a forest for 10,000 years, you're going to know it well and understand how to thrive within it and your culture is going to reflect that in some way. And so just a quick, quick map of 1760s. If we look at the 70, 1760s trade routes of the Western Great Lakes, we can see uh, who was kind of documented as being here. If we look at the state of Wisconsin on the map to the left of, west of uh, Lake Michigan, left of Lake Michigan, we'll see the Menominee, the Ho-Chunk, the Meskwaki, the Sauk, the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, the Kickapoo a little bit down in Illinois. Um, so we can get a sense of people who are here at least in the 1760s when the fur trade economy really started growing. And then if we fast forward to the 1830s a little bit, we see a slightly different map. Uh, we notice that the Meskwaki are no longer here. They moved a little further to the Southwest uh, for all sorts of Indian Removal Act outcomes. Um, so we get a sense of who's around us. And then if we focus on ourselves here today, um, if we look at these sections in the tan, orange, and kind of salmon color, pink color, ignore the purple colors. Um, we can see the 10 million acres of the Ho-Chunk Nation, um, and we can see the land session dates from 1829, 1832, and 1837, when the Ho-Chunk, uh, through violence backed land sessions, they were under threat of extreme violence um, for the 1829 and 1832 uh, treaties in particular. The 1837 treaty I mentioned earlier is considered completely legally dubious today, and so it's always a, a bit of a shock that the United States, you know, repeatedly breaks its own laws or or rewrites its laws uh, for Indian land for Indian land grab in some way, trying to get these resources. But just really important stuff. And then here, if we think about this, is a uh, during the Black Hawk War uh, that happened here in the 1830s. Uh, this is just a map from John Hall's uh, Uncommon Defense Indian Allies in the Black Hawk War that just shows a tremendous documentation of villages, and we can see the ten different kind of nations um, that are represented. Uh, in these villages uh, around the southern part of Wisconsin that period of time. And so it just reminds us of how many different peoples have lived in this region, how many different cultures, how many different languages have flourished in this region over time. So just really special. And then if we go back even a little further in time, uh, here's a monuments that we know today as conical linear and effigy mounds. These documents, th these images are of effigy mounds, meaning effigy means a likeness. And we can see a double-tailed water spirit emerging kind of from the snow uh, on Observatory Hill at the UW-Madison campus at Agriculture Hall. At the top of the hill, you can see that figure. The bottom left figure, we can see some leaves have been uh, the Bentwing Goose that's near the Natatorium on our campus. Uh, those two images are then kind of shown a little bit on the right. And there's a double-tailed uh, water spirit and the, and the bird effigy that's just to the left of it on the hill is represented in one of our buildings. And then the bottom map just shows the locations of the bentwing goose effigies that were around the Four Lakes system. And the bentwing goose is the signature effigy of the Four Lakes, meaning you don't find them anywhere else in the system of effigy mounds, that they're just really located around the Four Lakes, so it's a very special thing. And because we have one of the bentwing gooses on our campus, and it's such a special cultural signifier of this region, it's now a nationally registered historic site as is the double-tailed water spirit that's also a nationally registered historic site because of its cultural importance. Um, just a reminder how terraformed this place really has become. The most significant geological feature of Madison was destroyed to create the city of Madison. Madison was a wetlands region, mostly marshes. Uh, lots of the isthmus, lots of the western side of a campus, uh, kind of this, basically the southwest corner of Lake Mendota had to be fill in all these marshlands and wetlands to develop the region. And so the dividing ridge used to be this half mile long, eight story high berm of earth that kind of ran from where Park Street and Olin Avenue to our zoo in town, to the Madison Public Zoo. And uh, this massive wall of earth that was formed from the last glaciation period uh, was completely torn down to fill in all sorts of wetlands in this town. And all these uh, incredible effigy mounds and monuments were on top of that, that uh, dividing ridge. And so we can kind of see it superimposed today on our map where we can see the uh, kind of arboretum uh, to the left and Lake Wingra kind of to the left of where the wide dividing ridge on the right side, we can see the, uh, just a corner a smidge of, of Monona Bay and Lake Monona. 
And then 1836 sketch of the isthmus. So it's kind of hard to read, but the isthmus is kind of, if we go left to right, uh, the isthmus on the left side is uh, what is called, I think, uh, Wisconsin Avenue today. So the lower left of this diagram shows the Capitol Hill. It says high natural ground. All the lakes can be seen from here. And that's the little arrow that says today's state capital in the lower left hand side. So this is a, we're looking at a 3D kind of image um, from above. So we can kind of see the relief of hills represented and all these monuments that were on the earth. And so the left side is kind of from the Capitol to the Edgewater Hotel here in our town, running up the isthmus toward Tenney Park. We can see Third Lake in the lower right hand corner. And that's meant to represent Lake Monona and the Ahara River connecting Lake Monona to Lake Mendota. So we can just see the incredible depth of development that was witnessed here when uh, the first kind of survey crews came to this town. So this is just a highly impressionistic drawing. It's not necessarily super accurate, but at least it lets us know how developed this region was prior to the arrival of the United States. And then if we looked at the bigger picture of the whole state, uh, we'd realize that this effigy mound system of conical linear and effigy mounds uh, covers about 20,000 square miles on the left-hand map, the county map of Wisconsin, every gray area represents where you will find these amazing monuments that were developed over a period of almost 2,000 years. And uh, we can see Dane County in the lower center, the dark rectangle with a little white dot in the middle, that's Lake Mendota. So we can see that there used to be over 1,000 of these monuments here, about 1,200. And the map on the right now, looking at the four lakes, shows us these little dots all over the map represent clusters of these mounds. So, these mounds were usually not built in isolation. These usually were built in, um, or uh, kind of a grouping would emerge over time as people constructed in the same location. And so we can just see how intensely developed the Four Lakes region is with over 1,200 of these monuments that were developed here over time, or built here over time. And if we zoom in on Lake Mendota, the red dot on the map on the left is the Middleton Public Library. So uh, what a wonderful resource for your community. I myself am a power user of the one and only Penny Library on the far east side of Madison. I'm a power user at the Penny and I really love our library, South Central Library System. It's just really wonderful for all of us. Um, but once again, we can see the dark dots around Lake Mendota and we can see those groups. And so uh, the Woodland Shores group, I have a little red arrow coming from it, then points to you, shows what just one little dot can be. It's, uh, we see this really informative effigy mound grouping because it kind of shows a little bit of, of, of the, how they're organized in somewhat of a worldview. And now, culturally, we don't really understand what these mean today. Uh, the Ho-Chunk, uh, the Iowa, the Oto can all speak to their meaning in some way, um, but we haven't healed our relationships with them yet to fully know what this information is. And until then, there's a lot of speculation and guess of what these really represent. Um, but I use the Woodland Shores because the left side shows um, kind of the sky clans, those that are above the earth. So we have uh, Thunderbird and bird effigies um, represented on the left side. It's probably a higher ground area because functionally birds were usually built on a higher ground. In the middle section, we see kind of lower clans, those that are on the earth, those that walk on the earth. And uh, we have a bear and a couple canine figures. And on the right side, we see the water spirits, those that are under the surface. So we kind of above the surface, on the surface, below the surface. Um, kind of grouping and so it's just a really powerful reminder and these are very big so the birds are like 200 foot wingspan um, you know these berms of earth some linear mounds are over 200 feet so they're very large uh, constructions these monuments uh, and all of them are burial sites and so they're used to commemorate people in their society but once again we're not 100 percent certain of the cultural meaning behind them and all the kind of uh, reasons people might have built such massive monuments for just one or two people in their society the conical and the linear mounds are often mass grave sites, meaning instead of just one person with, interred within them, they, they were added to over time. And then Madison is really trying to celebrate and teach about this landscape. So we have Dejope Residence Hall. So Dejope named after the Ho-Chunk language for Four Lakes. Uh, we have effigy mounds kind of represented within them and trying to encourage our students to venture out into the environment around them to witness these amazing sites of human activity and human culture. And so for us, our last bit here is just to gain a deeper understanding of this place. We can use a framework forwarded by kind of indigenous scholars today in higher education. Uh, the concepts of respect, revitalization, reconciliation. Respect, you know, these are, uh, we're gonna understand that these are sovereign nations that have treaty-based relationships with the United States. They have creation stories that will inform all about who they are as a people. Um, 
we should uh, treat them as we treat any government. Uh, you know. uh, revitalization, you know, we should be focused on cultural and linguistic revitalization, considering the United States tried to destroy Native American languages and culture up until I was in elementary school in 1975. And just because uh, the law passed that says Native American language and culture are no longer criminalized, uh, doesn't mean every public institution suddenly embraces indigenous language and culture. Uh, 1990s, we have the Native American Language Act comes out to help, you know, help revitalize Native American languages. And so it's really important revitalization considering the incredible challenges that came with uh, colonization and the violence and brutality of colonization. And then reconciliation, you know, we, we should be thinking about how do we improve our relationships with one another? If we really want to understand this place better, to know kind of the hidden in plain sight information all around us. And, and then there are just innumerable kind of places that are so important in this Four Lakes area, but we don't know much about it because we have a lot of reconciliation to do considering the violence that was enacted toward the Ho-Chunk, the Iowa, the Oto, and others that were here in Southern Wisconsin. And so it's just really important for us to think about if we want to understand this better, uh, this idea of respect revitalization and reconciliation can help us gain that knowledge. And then our last thing is like, and then our individual work uh, for working with Native American communities and nations today is, is once again, respect, uh, do your homework. You know, there's a lot of information in the public domain today about Native peoples and Native nations. So if you're gonna engage a Native community or nation, please do your homework first so we don't have to cover the basics first that we, we can just start into something at a higher level instead of just covering some of the fundamentals. Relationships, hopefully long-term relationships that we're looking for. Often short-term relationships are not very beneficial for Native American nations. It usually takes the initial part of any relationship to explain to each other and get each other's background and information. Um, and so a lot of that heavy lifting happens in, and then people leave. And so if it's, if it's not a long-term relationship, indigenous peoples and nations usually spend a lot of effort educating others and there's not a lot of return in it. So long-term relationships are, are much, much better you know, in terms of understanding one another and, and being able to share different parts of our culture with each other. A reciprocity, hopefully in the things we do that there is a two-way street and there's mutual benefit for both parties involved. Um, so you wanna think clearly if you're asking something of someone, um, you know, what are you providing in return of equal value in some way? Uh, I, I've, I've been asked at least three times now, if it, just a random email from somebody, if I will build their, their daughter or kid some Native American cultural object because they just want it. And I'm like, I don't know them. I'm not sure why they're asking me for this. There's no reciprocity at all involved in this. Um, and so just reciprocity is a really important concept to consider. And then relevance, hopefully it's, hopefully it's something that's you know, important and, and necessary to address in some way. Native American nations and communities uh, often are at their capacity for running their own governments and operating those support services for their citizens of their nations. And, um, and that's a, it's a lot of work. And so Native American nations and communities are often interested in, in connecting with others, but there's oftentimes a capacity issue for how many different people the Native nations and communities can connect with. So relevance is a, another important concept that hopefully it's not just a, a uh, someone's just curiosity driving this that doesn't have a real outcome but it really hopefully has a relevance for Native American nations in some way. So I, those are just the kind of hidden in plain sight, just kind of giving you a broad brush overview of the incredible specialness of this region. 12,000 years of human life, thriving, uh, just high quality living for such a long period of time for everyone in this special place. And then we just have a few tools for thinking about how we can um, work with Native nations uh, with the bigger overarching concepts of respect, um, revitalization and reconciliation, and then the smaller set of respect, relationships, reciprocity and relevance as particular tools to employ uh, in working with Native nations. So just really quick broad brush, I just wanted to share just how special this place is. Every time I go out and encounter the thousand year old monuments that are here, I just feel so recharged and so excited to understand this world better. And so I just wanted to say thank you for your time and energy for allowing me to just do this quick overview and broad brush of, of how things can be hidden in plain sight and not necessarily uh, we're fully aware of, of how developed the landscape is around us from this 12,000 years of, of humans, human living on the lake shores. And this question map, uh, we put up a new uh, marker on campus called the Our Shared Future Marker, which talks about our need for reconciliation and that truth telling in order for us to understand this space better. And so it's just a series of heritage markers that are on Bascom Hill. And we're really excited to add a new one called the R Shared Future Heritage Marker, 
which talks about kind of how we can build relationships with one another and understand one another through some truth telling and, and uh, some reconciliation work. So I thank you and I look forward to answering a few questions. So I'll turn it over to my wonderful colleague who's gonna help us uh, with this part. All right, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, also, thank you for the library shout out, much appreciated. Um, and I know that was a whole lot of information to pack into a very, very short time. Um, so if you do have a question, please uh, type it into the chat function um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and Aaron is happy to answer questions. Um, our first one is from Anne, um, talking about um, what is being taught in elementary schools. Do you have any information on whether Wisconsin schools are helping their students develop a sense of place that includes the things that you were discussing? Yeah, um, Wisconsin had a really interesting um, educational kind of statutes that were passed in 1989-1991 biennium budget. And the name of the 1989-1991 Wisconsin biennium budget was called Act 31. And so the nickname for the expectation to teach the history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the 12 Native American nations of Wisconsin at least once in elementary, I'm sorry, at least twice in elementary and at least once in high school uh, go back to this uh, state mandate, state statutes. So although the state statutes were passed uh, in, in the, so long ago, um, some schools do amazing creative work around this and some schools do no work around this. And so um, it was Act 31 was uh, unfunded and unenforced statutes. And so there isn't a kind of compliance component to it. So some schools do a lot with it. Some schools don't do much with it. Um, I, feel, I feel for all K-12 educators in that um, teachers have been held so accountable for uh, literacy and numeracy uh, testing. And so unfortunately, social studies as a whole has kind of been pushed to the side as teachers and schools are held accountable, accountable for kind of literacy and numeracy requirements. And, and so unfortunately, yeah, I wish we told our story a little better. Um, but uh, some schools, once again, do incredibly wonderful things and other schools, maybe not as much. Um, but there are state statutes that say teach the history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the 12 Native nations at least twice in elementary and at least once in high school. All right, thank you. Um, a question from Samantha. Um, growing up in St. Louis, Missouri, I was taught to use the term Native American and that the term American Indian was considered offensive. Since yeah. I've been in college at UW, I've noticed a lot of folks use the term American Indian and embrace it. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? And is there uh, one that is more respected than the other? Yeah, the root issue, like the, every term kind of labeling indigenous peoples that isn't in our own languages, right? It isn't our own term of self-reference. Like the goal is Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, you know? I mean, the goal is to know a specific nation. And, and, and I just remind people that. So all these continental terms, terms that are trying to describe an entire continent, uh, the United States doesn't do well with two continents in particular. Uh, one is Africa. Uh, we always just refer to Africa. We rarely refer to a nation within Africa. We just kind of call it a continent. And, United, and American Indians on our continent similarly kind of have this kind of monolithic uh, kind of presentation. And, and so I just remind people that these continental terms are challenging. The real problem term in both of them is the word America. And people don't really think about that as the problematic term. But that is the problematic term. Because where does that word come from? That's the name of a person, <laughs> Americo Vespucci, a cartographer, an Italian cartographer who puts his name on half the planet, you know, the Western Hemisphere. And uh, so American Indian is like, you know, Joe Indian or Native Joe. I mean, it's just somebody's name, right? So America is really the problematic term uh, because it is somebody's that derivation of somebody's name. So it just reminds us that they're both problematic in their own ways. Uh, the real goal is to know somebody as Menominee, Ho-Chunk, or Ojibwe. Um, so specific terms or specific nations and specific cultures are what we're aiming for. Just a quick refresher, American Indian refers to the lower 48. So those are the lower 48 states because we added two states in the 20th century. Um, well, we added more than two states, but our latest two states were Hawaii and Alaska. And the indigenous people that have been living in those places for a long period of time as well. And so we had American Indian refers to the lower 48. Alaska natives do not like being called the word Indian. And so uh, they have their own term, Alaska native today, right? And then we have native Hawaiian because they're indigenous peoples of the kingdom of Hawaii. 
So to be really inclusive, you'd say, you know, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian, and then your tweet's over because you're out of characters, right? So, so because of that issue, we, we've been trying to find sh shorter ways of describing indigenous people of the continent. And so in Native American is actually the lower 48 plus Alaska. That's what that word means. Native American means lower 48 plus Alaska, but doesn't include Native Hawaiian. Right? So, so all the terms that have their own challenges, there's kind of individual preference uh, by people for which term they individually prefer. Here in the Western Great Lakes, American Indian is widely used. It's just pretty well accepted and used. Um, we have the American Indian Studies Program, at University of Wisconsin, Madison. But First Nations is a term that's begun to be used in the Western Great Lakes. And so First Nation Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, First Nation Studies, uh, Milwaukee Public Schools, First Nation Studies, Un University of Wisconsin Superior. So we're seeing this First Nations term creep into the, the lower Great Lakes. It's used in Canada widely. It's a, a term that's been used in Canada, but there are Ojibwe people on the North shore of Lake Superior and Ojibwe people on the South shore of Lake Superior. Why do we call them First Nations on one side and American Indian on the other side? Now, how does that make sense if you're Ojibwe? And these imaginary dotted lines called borders were suddenly you know, put and split your nation in half in some way. Um, so it's interesting, these terminologies, these kind of colonial terminologies of, for the continent, but uh, American Indian and First Nations are widely used in the Western Great Lakes. If you go in other parts of the United States, you might find that one term is used over other terms. But I just remind people that they're all kind of problematic in their own way, and that um, hopefully the goal is to know a specific Native Nation. Thank you. A uh, question from Andrew. Could you share a bit about the 12th tribe, which is not currently recognized, and what happened? Yeah, so um, if I go back a slide, well, maybe I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. Not going to do that. Um, the, the, one of the quick maps I went over was a Blackhawk village map, or the, sorry, the Blackhawk War village map in John Hall's book. And it, and it, and it shows a little bit about um, villages in this place. And it says the New York Indians is one of the villages, right? So New York Indians. And the New York Indians were uh, the Oneida, the Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohican Nation, and the Brotherton Nation. And those three nations were kind of an experiment in early kind of assimilation and removal. So they were removed from the Eastern seaboard from like New York, uh, Delaware, uh, Massachusetts, uh, that kind of region, the Northeast region. And they were relocated here in Wisconsin in the 1820s. And, and so when the ethnic cleansing period came to Wisconsin that we kind of saw earlier, that 40 year attempt to remove indigenous peoples from the state, um, the Brotherton were, were threatened with removal and the only way they were going to be allowed to purchase land in Wisconsin was to kind of uh, rescind their tribal sovereignty through an act of Congress in the U.S. government, so the federal government, an act of Congress. And so unfortunately, the, the tribal sovereignty of the Brotherton Nation was uh, rescinded through an act of Congress. I don't know if rescinded is the right legal term, but it's the term I'm using right now. And um, unfortunately, the only way for the Brotherton to be reinstated is through another act of Congress due to the way the, that tribal sovereignty was terminated. So it's a complicated issue where it goes back to, you know, the threat of violence and removal and the Brotherton uh, making the hard choice to say, it, we think we can live here well um, if, it, if, it, if it has our tribal sovereignty is no longer recognized by the United States. Um, it was a decision they made at that time. And, and unfortunately, the, the Brotherton have, have appealed to be reinstated as a federally recognized tribe um, but once again, the only way for that process to happen is through an act of Congress currently. Um, so a little bit about the 12th uh, nation here in Wisconsin that is non-recognized today, but is indigenous peoples from the Eastern seaboard who were removed to Wisconsin in the 1820s as part of the early assimilation attempts uh, by the United States. All right, thank you. Um, all right, our last question is from Dan. Uh, would revitalization include the possible renaming of our lakes around Madison, uh, like Minneapolis did with the former Lake Calhoun? Yeah, that would be that would be a good idea. It would be useful. Um, you know, we'd all learn a lot. Uh, the Ho Chunk called Lake Mendota Wonchikomik, uh, Wonchikomikla, if, um, and it translates as where the man lies, and it's a cultural story about their connection to the lake and their kind of worldview. Um, that's kind of reflected in some of the kind of water spirit mounds around the lake. And so they have this really 
the story of this lake and, and how it's named and it reflects these thousands of year old monuments that are around the lake. And so it's a really powerful uh, kind of name, Wong Chikomik, where the man lies. And it kind of reflects their worldview and culture. Whereas Mendota kind of reflects our culture to some degree. It's like, okay, capitalism, yes, check. Need a name to sell something, check. Gonna make up a name to sell something, check. You know, that's Mendota, right? And that's land speculation. So, so yeah, I mean, our history is, is about colonization, right? It's about the successful colonization of the space and, and the kind of ha hodgepodge naming strategies that uh, the United States uses is kind of reflected in our colonization, or the colonization of the continent. And so I think it would do a wealth of education for all of us if, like I opened up and I had that signs that were in three languages, French, English, and Cree, um, that if we had our signs in indigenous languages, like on the ancestral lands of whatever indigenous place you're in, um, that we had multilingual signs in English and in indigenous languages, I think we'd all be richer for understanding this space. I think we'd all be, uh, be surprised at what we would learn and, and how and why indigenous people refer to a space in a certain way. And it's really reflective of their culture that has been developed over a long period of time in this place. And, and when you kind of see how and why indigenous names uh, come, come to be, um, they, they have a much more deliberateness than often, you know, needing to sell 10,000 land speculation brochures and coming up with a name. Um, so I know we're, we've, been, we've been trying to think about how to include indigenous words and indigenous languages into descriptions of this place. And it's a work in progress. And, and it's something we're, we're deeply considering as we kind of go forward, because there's a sincere hope for more indigenous place names being um, revitalized or, or being um, reinstated or, or brought to the greater awareness of, of the greater public about you know, the cultures and the amazing peoples that have thrived in this place for so, so long. All right. Well, Aaron, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to speak with us. Um, and thank you all for attending. Um, the uh, a recording of the presentation will be available on our website for a short time. Um, so please share it uh, with, with your friends, family, and neighbors. And thank you again, Aaron. We really appreciate you taking the time. Have a great evening, everyone.